Hello, my name is Brooklyn Ball President Eric Adams, and I am just disgusted. I'm disgusted. Just to think, the culture of indifference in NYCHA. And the problem is not merely one cleaning person, one office employee, one manager. It is a cesspool of culture and difference. It should not take public pressure to increase the goddamn water pressure. It is unbelievable, unbelievable what has taken place in the NYCHA residents all across the city. Historically, NYCHA was the stepping stone to move to home ownership and government. Governmental agencies supported the residents and allowed them the opportunities to continue to explore the American dream. We reached a point that NYCHA residents feel as though they are in purgatory and they're only reaching the American nightmare of how you're treated in the richest country on the globe. We had spigots here where seniors were carrying buckets. This is goddamn America, not Afghanistan. Seniors had to carry buckets of water to their apartments. The indifference, we're not concerned of your health needs, we're not concerned of how you get the water to your apartment. We're not concerned about it. We're just gonna line up spigots here. You fill it up, you get it up to your apartment any way you know how. This would not happen in middle class America. It should not happen in the Brownsville, Beth Stuyvesant, South Jamaica, Queens, Bronx, and all parts of this city. This cannot be happening. And then to run here and, and clean up and, and act like this is the normal day in NYCHA. It's not the normal day in NYCHA. It's unimaginable what is happening. And when I heard this, when I received a, an email from a tenant who told me her water was out for weeks. Wow. Wow. I told my staff, well, let's go online and look at the online portal and the online dashboard so we can analyze the problem. And you go online and you see that the water was out for four hours. Because the game they're playing of misreporting, it comes on for five minutes, they close the ticket, and then they want you to start the process all over. And I challenge you to go through the dark hole of getting answers from those who you call the number to ask what's going on. Broken system. And so, just wanted to get some housekeeping. Done. I, I'm so riled up. That I, you know, I wanna, we want to just really, really want to thank the people here. And you see community and residents coming together. The auxiliaries, the explorers, our elected officials, the TA president, all of us coming together for one entity, government. We need to get a damn milk cotton and put government on the face of it and say lost child because they not they have not been here. They don't care. Missing. And so, 13 buildings, 2,000 people. Water out for several weeks. Turning on the shower in the morning, getting there 
just for the shower to turn off on you, unable to go to your place of employment with your basic necessities. These are basic necessities. Got to catch the water on time while it's on. Too many NYCHA residents say to themselves, it's just another day in NYCHA. They've thrown up their hands, it's just another day in NYCHA. When I emailed back the young lady and said, why you let people know ahead of time? She says, no one is hearing us. This is just another day in NYCHA. Well, you know what, we hear you. We hear you. NYCHA residents have no longer believed that they're entitled to clean water, heat in the summertime, clean grounds, lights, lead-free apartment, holes not in the walls, elevators that operate, all the basic necessities they no longer believe they are entitled to and they continue to fight to make sure they get there. Nothing seems to complain, to, to, to respond when you complain. We have to improve the transparency. If you don't inspect what you expect, it's all suspect. We have to have the same mechanism we use to bring down crime in the city must be used to address the NYCHA crisis, real-time governance where we can analyze when the problem was developed, when it was fixed, and how long it took, and who was responsible for not correcting the problem. This is what we use to clean up crime. 25 years later, crime is still decreasing because we held people accountable and we use the technology that is available to monitor the system. You can't be still using composition black notebooks to document the problems in NYCHA. That is a rotary phone method in an iPhone age. The game must change. If you use technology to decrease crime and to monitor productivity in public America and public business, then you should do it in public housing. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason, there's a reluctancy to use technology to monitor when boilers are out and repaired, when things are done in a correct manner, because as long as we keep hiding in the numbers and no one can expect them, then you could keep giving false data and false information. These are professional liars. One in 14 residents live in NYCHA, powerful body of residents. Today is really about demanding that NYCHA address the systematic failure to communicate. All people want is communication. That's all they're asking for. Just tell us what's going on so we could monitor our day. We're not giving people the basic communication. That's the highest level of disrespect and insult when you don't communicate with the residents to let them know what is happening. How dare them say that the outage was only an hour when it was weeks? Two water tanks. We still don't know today what was the problem. One water tank had a homeless person sleeping inside the tank. That homeless person had a better accommodation than some of the apartments that we've seen in Niger. Right. He would rather sleep in the tank than sleep in some of the apartments that we see here. Took all this time to clean the tank. Weeks. Weeks to clean the tank. Seniors, no assistance given to carry the water to, uh, to the apartments. Water coming on in dribs and drabs. No information on when the, parts, the tanks were finally cleaned. The website, improper information. Residents of NYCHA need increased transparency. 
communications with residents, additional real-time monitoring, real-time monitoring of infrastructure and ticket and property of, of, of property problems. Reform of the ticket system. Problems are not fixed when they're temporarily fixed. They're fixed when they are properly done and completed. So if the water only comes on for an hour, it should be attached to the original complaint. When the problem is resolved, that's when the ticket is closed. Duh. This is not complicated, folks. Our tenants' residents are not our enemies. They are first responders. We should treat them as such. If we only communicate with them, we can resolve many of these issues that are taking place instead of using them as the adversaries. Use them as the partners. And these issues can be resolved. So we're going to, we have a two week period before the US Attorney's empowerment of bringing in an oversight to NYCHA in my conversation with the council person, we're going to hold a series of hearings to hear directly from the tenants, not at city hall, not at borough hall, but right in the community centers of your buildings. Hear from you firsthand, what should we be telling this new person that's going to oversee how the city moves forward? We want to hear directly from you in the process. And <laughs> this stuff is just, <laughs> just mind-boggling. Our seniors in their senior center, it doesn't have an air condition. A, and it's supposed to be a cooling center. $1,200 piece. $1,200 piece to get them a, an air conditioner so it could be a cooling center for this entire community. They put the $1,200 piece out to bid. I'll give them the $1,200 to fix this air conditioner. When the councilwoman called me, I said, Councilwoman, we'll give them the $1,200. They won't even take the $1,200 from the Department of the Aging to fix it. They would rather these seniors sit in heat as they, and two fans, as they wait for the, the air conditioner to be repaired, those in charge are going home and clicking on their central air and sitting down in their living room with the comfort and making sure their family members and their mothers and their grandmothers have the cool that they need so their asthma is not disrupted. But our grandmothers and our mothers and our children have to go through these conditions. Hell no! No! And so, I cannot thank both the assemblywoman and the councilwoman enough. Patrice and Alika have really just taken this, this fight firsthand. Talk about, talk about all the time about how we must improve NYCHA. Some of the largest concentration of NYCHA residents are located in their districts. When Jimmy Carter was president, folks took him to the South Bronx when, during his president season, we demanded that the candidates come and walk through NYCHA. We walked through NYCHA in Brownsville with the first presidential candidate to walk through and see these conditions. We're going to put this on blast, and I cannot thank the members of the media enough. Yay. Cannot thank you enough. You have not let this go. You have been tenacious, you have been forthright, and you have not allowed the voices of this community to be ignored. We cannot thank you enough. And I hate calling out one station, but Channel 11, you've been doing your thing. <laughs> you've been doing your thing.
you know, so staying on this issue is so important, staying on this issue and keeping this issue forthright. So I want to turn it over to our two heroes, our two elected. Uh, we also, uh, we're here with the TA president uh, as, as well. Uh, and I'm just, you know, I'm so emotional that I'm losing all my notes. Uh, we want to thank uh, the representative from Senator Montgomery's office, uh, Shati Robbins Kubus. We also thank uh, the, I'm going to get to some other names. We want to hear from uh, Margarita Whitehurst in a minute, resident of 63 years. 63 years. Lucy M. Margaret is a resident of 63 years. We have Lucy M., a young lady who's, who's also a resident. So we see our long existence residents and our young residents all still looking to make NYCHA a, a place to be. We're also joined by our uh, district leader uh, as, as well. So if we're all here uh, together. Uh, to make this issue a, a real issue. So I want to turn it over to Councilwoman, please, <laughs> uh, rescue me. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Councilwoman Alika Samuel, and I just want to thank the Borough President just for all of your leadership and really making this happen because a lot of times the residents will call and try to get people to stand by them shoulder to shoulder and their voices are never heard but you find a way to always amplify the voices of some of the most vulnerable new yorkers mm -hmm. and i just want to say thank you for that so several years ago i worked for the united states government i worked for the state department representing the united states in a developing country and my role in that developing country was to make sure that villages and families who were struggling every single day had access to health care, had quality health care, had clean water, had access to water, had energy, energy efficiency. And that was in a developing country. Mm. And that developing country looked at the United States of America as one of the wealthiest countries that was looking out for them. And fast forward, I come back home to New York, I come back home to Brownsville, and we have residents who are standing by spigots mm. trying to get water to their homes. Mm -hmm. right. It sounds a lot like a developing country, yeah. but in not only the wealthiest country, but one of the wealthiest cities yeah. in America. Yeah. How is that possible? It sounds like a war zone mm, mm, mm. right here. But we have the resources to not allow this to happen. So we're starting to feel like the residents of public housing is being starved out, yeah. right? Yeah. If you have a car, you need to put oil in it. Right. You need to put gas in That's it. Right. You need to do proper maintenance in order for that car to work. If you have a building, you need to have proper maintenance. It has to have running water. It has to have energy in order for it to work. But if it doesn't have that, it doesn't work. And we know when it doesn't work, it starts to collapse. So is it by design that they're starving out our buildings so that it can eventually collapse? Mm -hmm. That's right, that's right, that's right. Well said. Because I'm starting to look <laughs> really? at all the development that's happening around our community and Bree Boy Houses, along with other public housing, mm. has been difficult to tap into mm. when you look at other people wanting to come in and change our community. That's right. Public housing has always been difficult to tap into. But when you starve it out and you make it collapse, that's an opportunity for it to no longer exist and develop. And so I stand here with the borough president and I stand here with our assemblywoman and the leaders of public housing to say we are not going to allow you to starve us out. You are going to give us what we need right now because you have the resources. And so that's my role as a chair of public housing, and I'm here, and, and, and the fight will continue, and we will win this battle, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Make your case. <laughs> Assemblywoman Latrice Walker. Good morning. I guess we're still in morning. Morning and in morning, right? Uh, 
when I think of the catastrophe that has happened in public housing, it reminds me of being five years old, six years old. Growing up in public housing, which was not very far away from here. And so I want to talk for a second about the resiliency of the people. My mom had a system where she would save all of the milk jugs from purchasing gallons of milk. And when we knew that the water was going to go off because the water was going to go off, mm -hmm. she'd have all of these water jugs that were filled. Some of them would go into the refrigerator for us to drink. Some of them would be in the bathroom where we would have a basin and she would put water in and we would bathe in the sink or we would bathe in the basin, in that basin. Right? This was decades ago. And the people and the resiliency is still the same. This is the same people we talked a little bit about being from South Carolina. And in South Carolina, there's a, a well in my backyard. And at that well, my grandmother used to stand outside and she would pump and she would fill her bucket and she would come inside and she would handle her business to provide water and resources to her family. The resiliency of a people that did not just happen because the spotlight is on, because the issue is in vogue. It is a people who for too long have had to learn how to do so much with so little. That's right. And water is just one issue. Even though it's a main issue, most of the universe is water. It's readily, it's available, but I can't understand how we're so scarce. But we talk about the elevators. For the most part, the elevators are not broken. What has been happening is an environmental justice catastrophe in our community. Whenever the summertime hits and the hour of energy operation is peak, Con Edison turns the power down into our communities. We get emails from it. There are notices that are put outside to let us know that the energy currency, just like the water current, is not comparable to the rest of the city. So I've heard people talk about a tale of two cities. Even if we could get to the level where we could say that we are a city, as opposed to some rural country, as opposed to some backwoods village, as opposed to some developing country in some other part of the universe. So we can say that we are also residents of New York City in this tale of two cities. We didn't even make it to the book. That's right, that's right, that's right. We didn't even make it to the book. The walls are coming down around us, but, this is all we have. Where are we going to go? What are we going to do? This is the only real affordable housing that this city has. People have lived here for generations. I've heard 50 years, I've heard 63 years. We're not going anywhere. And they came to our development, the development I was born and raised in, Prospect Plaza, and they knocked it down. 30 years nearly went by as we were going through this process before things were built back up. And they tried each and every way to say that the former residents who used to be there did not have the eligibility in order to move back in. But guess what? Just like we stayed the course there to make sure that those former residents were taken care of, we are going to stay the course here to make sure that the water that is necessary for our children to be able to grow up in healthy environments, this is not Detroit, the way that we are dealing with issues all across the country, the way that we need to be dealing with those issues here, right. enough is enough. Right. I am tired. Right. And we will take this fight, whether it's from 250 Broadway whether it is on Atlantic Avenue, whether it is on Church Street, to let everybody know that you did something spectacular. You represented leadership who understands NYCHA because we are NYCHA. 
It's in our bones. It's in our DNA. And we're ready to take this and check each and every one of their chins as it relates to the catastrophe that's being done here in our communities. So thank you so much, Mr. Borough President, for always keeping your finger on the pulse, always staying low and make sure that the community hears you and that you're hearing their cries. And I look forward to joining you in this fight as we make sure that basic necessities that environmental justice issues that people love to, you know, love to talk about all across the world, that we really make sure that people recognize that there are environmental justice That's issues right. happening go. right here, right in our neighborhood, well right in our backyard. Well Thank said. you. Well said. Well said. That's, that's the power of Brownsville. Never run, never will. <laughs> and and it is so fascinating as there was a level of anger and frustration that swept across America when Donald Trump was elected and people people felt pain. The pain they're feeling now is the pain that NYCHA residents have felt for years as the history was laid out of holding buckets and elevators and you know so this is not new pain to us. We know this pain and, and folks need to understand that so as they express their frustration we knew that frustration welcome to the club welcome to the club so i want to bring on i think it's important to hear from our residents and uh, i know uh councilwoman uh, wanted to point out that dr samuels from campaign against hunger um, we purchased a a mobile unit um, for moments like this uh, dr samuels is here she's going to pull the mobile unit out to yes. assist um, as people get some of the basic necessities uh, that they need. We want to thank you, Dr. Dr. Samuels. Uh, yes, you know, and um, again, I know I, I announced, but you know, we're happy that um, our district leader, uh, Dolly Milley, has joined us. I, wanted to, I want to turn it over to the residents. Uh, uh, Ms. Whitehurst, her, her story was just so powerful, but first I want to turn it over to the TA President, um, Penzi Nettles, resident for 50 years, 50 years. Thank you for everyone who has come out today. I have been trying ever since I've been president to get this development in order, but I guess it hasn't happened yet. So I am so very glad to have all of these people here today to try to get our development the way it should be. Thank you. <laughs> like that. Yeah. We can we can tell you're not a politician. No. <laughs> <laughs> and we're we're going to hear we're going to hear from just a real clear on the ground commentary of what is happening inside our apartments. We, we want to hear from our elder, uh, Miss Whitehurst, and then yeah, from Lucy yeah, M, yeah. another resident. Go, Ma. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Good Thank morning. you for calling for listening to my story. I've moved here since I, in 1955. Mm. Oh. I'm the only person that ever lived in my apartment. Mm. Most people don't know, but I grew up in Kingsborough on the seventh walk. I went to junior high and high school living in Kingsborough. And during the time that I was in high school, my family bought a house on Jefferson Avenue and I moved. But getting back to Brevard, what happened to us hurt me to my heart. Mm. I have a young friend, I, her mother and I were friends, and we call each other and tell that she called me five o'clock in the morning, and she said, you know, it's no water at all. So, she was so annoyed that she called Channel 7. That's right. And they came out to visit us and we told them. In the meantime, I slept about two hours because I saw these two white trucks out there. I saw no police cars. I felt fear. I didn't want to call 911. I called 311 to try to find out if NYSA would send somebody out. 
I didn't know what those white car trucks were doing. I find out the next morning they was putting faucets out for us to come out and get water. I got up five o'clock in the morning to try to, the water was on, I jumped in the shower. And before I got out the shower, the water was off. Which is, and this is going on for days. It's unbelievable what we're going through. It hurt me through my heart. And I'm a person that's been working with the, whoever was here since I was old enough. Mr. Montgomery, his wife, they're both deceased. We worked together, we had Little League Baseball. I worked with Councilwoman Darlene, her whole tendency, and anything that I can do, because we're not crazy, we're not ignorant, and when you shut my water off, and there was no sign up in my, in my hallway. That we don't want. Right. And I'll do whatever I can, as long as I live, to try to stop this. I'm with you guys, the Thank young you. and the old. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. Thank you. And, and Lucy M., we're young and old. <laughs> um, the first thing that I would like to say is I'm so sorry to everybody that is suffering this with, along with me. Um, this isn't just affecting the elders, it's affecting the youth, it's affecting the children, it's affecting everybody. Um, this right that's being snatched away from us blatantly in clear day in front of everybody, it's, it's disgusting. I, as the 19 year old here, I feel like I'm suffering for a 32 year old woman that has four different kids because I've seen that happen where they would wake up and literally I would hear the yelling in the other apartments, there's no water, how are we going to take care, how are we going to clean our kids? How are we gonna get them to school? How are we gonna clean our clothing? Because there are people that wash their clothes at home because they're not able to afford going to clean them at laundromats. I am a 19 year old young woman. I am in college. This, this specific thing that we're all going through, it's, it's mentally messing with me because I just started a new job. I'm getting about my business. How am I supposed to be productive when, if I cannot get up early in the morning, being able to know that I'm guaranteed water to drink, water to wash myself with so I do not offend others? How am I supposed to function every single day? How am I supposed to function? L literally, I'm going crazy because I have to get up in the morning thinking, do I have enough money in my pocket to go and buy a bottle of water so I can take it with me at work, so I can fill up my bottle of water at work multiple times so that I can have a bottle of water just to go home to be able to drink something? Us being told that we have to bring buckets, some in which we pay for ourselves to have the water that we have the right to have, is plain out disrespectful. And then we ha you have the audacity to tell us Oh, it'll be a few more days. Don't worry about it. We got it. This has been happening for more than three weeks, a whole week of spotting of water. A whole week we would have to literally time manage ourselves. When do we think the water going to come back on? When is the hot water going to come back on? We would have to literally take time out of our days, out of every day, just to make sure that we're good. When we know that it's a physical right that we should already have. I feel violated, I feel abused, I feel the pain for everybody else, and that's why I'm here today, making sure that I advocate for everybody, because this is not right. Because at the end of the day, there are people that are here standing, listening to us, recording, and then they go back to their everyday life, going back to their homes, comfortable, being able to know that they have something to eat at the end of the day, being know that, that they're valid and able to go into their showers and feel like they're a human being because they have those things because they're able to advocate for themselves. And there are so many people that are here today knowing that we're gonna go back into our buildings and we're gonna have to suffer two to three more weeks of spotting of no water. One week of no water, one straight week, no water. That can mess with you. And we paying for the water that we get because if we don't have a big enough bucket, we have to go to Costco and buy a $50 gallon of water so that we can continuously be able to fill it up so that we can at least function throughout the day. It is unacceptable we're going through. And if nothing is going to happen, I promise you we're going to keep coming up. We're going to keep advocating for ourselves until this is done. 
Thank you so much for everybody that took the time out of their day to be here and to listen to us. Thank you so much, and please let this not continue. Thank you. Well said, well said, Lucy. So I'm going to uh, reach out this, this afternoon to the governor's office to find the funding to put in place a CompStat system to monitor NYCHA. If we don't use technology, that's the missing piece, then we will always find out about the crisis long after it's done. You can't fix the barn door once the horse is gone and running down the road. I'm going to ask him to allocate the, the money we need to finally put in place a system that we use to bring down crime, we can use it to bring down the incompetence, and a culture of indifference inside this agency. Thank you very much. I thank all my partners in government. I thank the NYCHA residents, auxiliary, the explorers, one community coming together. Thank you. Water. At home, take care of yourself. I think uh, all, just as our local electors are here on the ground, I think all of our electors, we can't stand the sterilized environment of our chambers while the dirt and grime of our communities are being impacted. We should walk through these communities. We should have a city hall and the governor's mansion should be in the community centers. That's how you fix problems. When you are not so far removed from the problem, when you are part of the problem, the best way to get NYCHA to operate effectively is to do city hall in your NYCHA development, not only in your borough, to do the governor's mansion and your and your NYCHA's resident, not only in Albany. When you are on the ground, that is how you fix crises, and it sends the right message. We, are, we don't only need electors who are infation, informational, we need those who are inspirational. Right. People should see their electors and say, you are on the ground with me fighting. So yes, all of them should be here, like these two local electors are here. Three, three we, we acknowledge you, sister. We acknowledge you, okay? Uh, 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 I'm sorry? Yes, I'm asking them to do a walkthrough. Come speak to these tenants, uh, communicate with them so that they can get a better understanding. I'm sure both of these electeds will communicate with him uh, to tell him to come in and see exactly what has been done wrong. This is a textbook case of the crisis in NYCHA. Falsely identifying what the problem is, taking too long to correct the problem, bureaucracy preventing something basic as getting a part for an air conditioner, this is a textbook case that needs to be studied. How do we can do it right? Well, I, and you know, I think it's I think it's important. First of all, we need to be very clear: the abandonment of the historical abandonment of NYCHA did not start under this administration. It started as the federal investigation revealed, it started in several administrations ago. The federal government has abandoned NYCHA, state government has abandoned NYCHA, and the city has abandoned NYCHA. Everyone needs to start embracing the residents of NYCHA. And the only way we can do this, and I want the tenants to know, don't get daunted, because how you force government to respond is to do what we're doing now. Don't, si don't suffer in silence. If you suffer in silence, we would be still unable to sit at lunch counters. We would be still unable to ride the buses on interstate commerce. We would still be unable to ride buses in the Deep South. We would still not be able to be inside classroom. It was this. It was coming out, voicing every time the ugly head of bigotry, racism, separation came up. Those historical people came out and fought, and that's where we are now. These are the children and the grandchildren of the civil rights movement continuing the civil rights fight. So notice it's not going to be done overnight, but it's going to be done with the, our might. And as long as we continue to fight like we're doing and saying we're not going to suffer in silence, that is the most therapeutic thing you can do is to acknowledge you are not going to be a victim and suffer in silence. Thank you.
So we're talking about cart. people of a certain age yes. having to... Um, Every, the whole development, if you wanted water, you have to go have right there. Right here, they have one at 234, Four. and then I think they got 223. We got another third. We had to go to the party school the weekend. But, where's the rest of our residents? Those people are sitting in the shade.